Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. When it comes to uh, understanding different personalities, different people, I've come to find, as I'm sure you have, that we largely use different categories of a variety of nature to, to describe people. Categories like tall or short, uh, big or small, introvert, extrovert, analytical, creative. This past week I was reminded of another very important category with which to understand people with. How many of you here, raise your hand if you would consider yourself a morning person? How many of you just got tired thinking about morning? <laughs> yeah. I uh, frequent a Casey's just down the street here for gas or anything else I need in the morning. And last week on a particular morning, I had to be here early. I was there before they opened, about five minutes early at 6 o'clock a.m. And there's a woman that works there. Her name is B, and she's a wonderful lady. She's very animated. And uh, she was the one that was opening that morning, which is not usual. She's usually not the one opening. And I was surprised to see her. And she opens the doors, and I walk in. I said, hey, B, good morning. And she goes, uh-uh. <laughs> There's nothing good about morning before 9 a.m. <laughs> I laughed about that all day just because she, she cracks me up the way that she talks. And I went online later to try and look at more uh, thoughts or sayings about those people who aren't fans of the morning. And maybe some of you uh, late-nighters can relate to some of these. Uh, I, I thought they were pretty funny. Uh, one person online said, I could be a morning person if morning happened around noon. <laughs> I'm not a morning person. I don't like mornings or people. <laughs> I don't trust people who smile before 9 a.m. That's what B told me when I walked into the store that morning. There are two types of people in the world, morning people and people who want to hurt morning people. <laughs> When people tell me you're going to regret this in the morning, I sleep in till noon because I'm a problem solver. <laughs> and this is my favorite one. I'm not an early bird or a night owl. I'm some form of permanently exhausted pigeon. <laughs> in our text today from Luke 21, Jesus is uh, only a few mornings away from his hour of glory on the cross. That's how he himself referred to it. And whether or not you're an a, a early riser or a late nighter, for all listening to Jesus then and now, Jesus' message is the same. Stay awake at all times. For the past several days, Jesus has been teaching in the temple and he's been fully aware that the cross is coming. In fact, he's been warning his disciples about this for quite some time, even though they haven't gotten it yet. And because that cross is coming, his teachings are becoming much more intense, much more direct. There's not so much concern about waiting for that hour to come anymore because that hour is now at hand. Scripture tells us that while the disciples and those following Jesus were coming out of the temple after Jesus had been teaching, they were goggling over the, the immensity of the temple and its beauty, the stones and how it's adorned. And in response to just their conversation about the temple, Jesus says to them in verse 6, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, to try and give you the experience that they would have received when they heard this, you have to have some idea of the massive size and magnitude of Herod's temple. The original temple, Solomon's temple, was destroyed, and even though that was the case, the original one was 500 cubits by 500 cubits, about 861 feet by 861 feet. That was the original temple. To put this in perspective, a modern football field is 360 feet by 160 feet wide. Now, when the temple was rebuilt by Herod, he added another 100 feet in both directions. 
And not only was the temple itself massive, nine stories at some points with walls that were 12 feet thick, but the biggest stones that made the walls of the temple individually measured 60 feet in length and seven feet in height. It's hard to comprehend. In fact, if you read the ancient historians like Josephus, they would say that the temple left everyone's mind in awe and amazement. So when Jesus says that not one stone will be left on top of another, it shouldn't surprise us that the disciples have some questions. What in the world is going to bring that about? When's it going to happen? What are the signs? Luke 21 is not the first time Jesus talked about the destruction of the temple. Many times he actually brought it up. One of the most prominent is after he walked into the temple and turned over all the money changers' tables who were making a mockery out of God's house by turning it into a business. And when he had turned over the tables of the money changers, the Pharisees and temple authorities came to, came to Jesus and said, who do you think you are? What sign are you going to give us to prove you have the authority to make this mess? John chapter 2, that's what they said. What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, here's the sign. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So in John 2, Jesus was already talking about his body and the temple at the same, dot, same time, not only as the temple and as his body, but both together. And in much the same way, when we read our text in Luke 21 about the end of all things, Jesus isn't just talking about one event. He's talking about many, not just one time or one occurrence. God exists outside of time, and so we have to keep that in mind if we're going to understand everything that Jesus is saying in Luke 21. After hearing Jesus say that not one stone would be left upon another, his disciples asked in verse 7 two important questions. Teacher, when will these things be, and what will be the sign that these things are about to take place? Generally speaking, in response, Jesus tells them a lot of things, a lot of things that if you actually take the time to read it, are familiar to you and I. He tells them that nation will rise against nation in war, how at the center of those wars will be the persecution of those who follow Jesus. You may not see it in America, but that still happens today in large measure. How even families will be broken and fractured because of Jesus. Brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers turning on each other because of faith. These aren't things that we have to look for, do we? These are things that are happening now. Jesus also talks about a time when the earth and all of creation will shake and writhe and come apart at the seams at the very end, when the heavens themselves will be shaken before the coming and the appearance of the Son of Man. Now, it's important that we remember, as I said earlier, there are two questions being asked, when and what. And when you look at Jesus' answer in this passage, it's hard to miss the fact that Jesus just completely disregards the first question, when. In fact, his answer seemingly has nothing to do but has everything to do with answering their question. They say when and what, and the first thing Jesus says in reply is, see that you're not led astray. 
The truth is, friends, all of what Christ talked about, other than his appearance, has already happened multiple times, even in your lifetime. These are the last days. They've been the last days since Christ rose from the dead. There isn't much that we can point to in this passage that you can't see if you turn on your television and watch the news. They all first happened to Christ, who was betrayed by family, who was abandoned by disciples, who was handed over to death by those that said they loved him. Jesus. Who had to stand before governors and rulers who mocked him and spit on him and killed him. Jesus. The disciples wanted to know when it would happen and what the signs would be. And Jesus' answer to them and for you and I today remains the same. His answer can be summed up by saying, it's all happening now. Look around. And yet, do we rise early each day or have even one hour of sleep stolen from us? because we live in such anticipation of Christ's return at any moment. I heard somebody once say, every man will get up early for something. What rises us early in the morning? What keeps us awake at night? I'll be honest with you and say that it's just as natural for me to be consumed with the thoughts of all the things in life that have no eternal consequences, that have nothing to do with my eternal salvation, with the nothing to do with what will actually last. Why is it we can bring ourselves to get up an hour early to avoid the crowds or stay up late another hour just to watch one more episode, but we can't sacrifice that same hour to be with the Lord who is coming and who has already come to us? Well, the answer to that question is because it's not in our nature. All of us being born in sin, it is our natural tendency to be alive and awake to ourselves, to be alive and awake to everything else except the one who gave us life. Those aren't my words. Those are exactly what God says in Galatians 5.17. The flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you're not able to do whatever you want. That's what Jesus means when he says, stay awake at all times. Part of staying awake is recognizing and seeing my nature. It was to the same disciples who argued over who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus said, stay awake. It was to the same disciples, James and John, who wanted to call down fire from heaven to burn all the bad guys in the world that Jesus says, stay awake. It was to the disciple Peter who vowed, even if everybody else falls away from you, I will never deny you. Stay awake. If while they were listening to Jesus, they had any doubt in their mind that they could fall asleep, it would literally be proven to them just a couple mornings later as Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, my soul is troubled to the point of death. And he asks his disciples to pray with him three times. Just pray with me. Stay awake and pray with me. They couldn't do it. Jesus found them sleeping and comes to them and says, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. There is no doubt that by faith in Christ, in the waters of baptism, 
you and I have been made a new creation in Christ. Yet until that last day comes when we see all of who God has declared us to be, and that becomes fully manifest to us, we have to stay awake first against ourselves, against that complacency in our hearts, against being lulled to sleep by a world that would gladly keep us awake to anything and everything else. These words of Jesus we hear today are some of the most difficult in all of Scripture, and they're not difficult because they're hard to understand. They're difficult because they're spoken to His disciples. Don't fall asleep, because you can. Dr. Jeffrey A. Gibbs is the professor of exegetical theology at Concordia Seminary, and he doesn't mince words either when he articulates what I think is the core of Jesus' teaching here. Jesus warns, and Dr. Jeffrey A. Gibbs says, if Christians fail to look for the return of Christ, they could lose their faith and fall away from the Lord. It is as simple as that. If Jesus is not coming to judge the living and the dead, or if I do not frame my life and all things in that way, then I open myself up to distraction and temptation because I do not really have to take things seriously. Failure to watch for Christ to come can deaden that awareness, cause us to lose our vigilance, and open us to dangerous temptation, and we could fall and be found among the goats and not the sheep. It's important that we understand what Jesus is telling his disciples and what he's not telling them to stay awake for. He is not telling them to stay awake to interpret the signs of the times so that they can guess when it's coming. He's telling them to stay awake against themselves. Many times Jesus said, hey, when that last day comes, it's going to be like a thief in the night. You don't know and you can't know when it's coming. So live like it's coming today. Stay awake. What does that actually mean, stay awake? What does that look like in our lives, that the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak? How do I deal with that? Well, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Christ Jesus is in you? Jesus told his apostles, they're going to they're gonna kill you, they're going to persecute you, but don't worry about what to say. I'll give you the words. How do I stay awake? How do I examine myself? Don't worry. He's giving you the words. That's how. Jesus would say, abide in my word. If you're my disciple, that is where you'll live because that's the only place you find life. You see, we stay awake and we watch ourselves and we test ourselves, not in order to bring Christ to us, but we test ourselves because do you realize that Christ is in you? Right when you were baptized. That he is both coming and is here now. He's given us such a precious salvation And such a precious faith, that is what is worth staying up at night for. That's worth getting up early for. We gladly sacrifice sleep and everything else for this life and for this faith that is a gift to us because Christ has risen, because he is alive and because he is coming. The good news of the gospel is that for all who trust in him, who who trust in Christ as the beginning and as the end, there is no end. The end is an eternal beginning. And that's why Jesus says when you hear of all this stuff going on, in verse 28, he says when you hear of all these things that are going to be, don't panic, straighten up, raise your heads. Your redemption is drawing near. Those words give us such hope, even in a world that's falling apart. 
They confirm the words of our Lord. What difficult things right now are you wrestling with, because I have them too, that remind you all good things come to an end? I know they're in your life, they're in my life. We all have them. If we understand what Jesus' words are in this text today, we can look at those things that remind us it will end, those times of suffering, those times of anguish. And if we hear what Jesus is saying, he says, don't you see the hope in that? Don't you see the hope in the cross? The Lord who brings life through death. The Lord who promised at the end of Revelation, behold, I am making all things new. Jesus told his disciples that they would be put to death for the sake of their faith in him. And yet by faith in him who died and rose again just as he promised, Jesus says to them in verse 18, not a hair of your head will perish. I'll close today with the words of Peter in 2 Peter 3, 11 through 12. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Amen.